Hello and welcome to the Power Switch, gaming's call-in talk radio show. My name is Peter Spasia, and today is February 15th, 2017. This is the 11th episode of the podcast. Thank you for tuning in. We use Discord as a means to add and drop callers to talk about video games and switch the power that's found in a typical gaming podcast. You can join our server to participate during recordings at rhymeswithasia.com slash call. You can subscribe to the Power Switch on podcast services such as iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. And if you'd be so kind as to leave a review, that would really help as well. It's so been off for a week with my birthday, Valentine's Day, celebrating those over the weekend, all sorts of things. I actually got to play uh, Gears of War 4 in co-op with my brother, going through the campaign there. And we're going to finish it tonight. We're on the last of the five acts. So uh, it's been okay. Uh, not good, not great, but not bad. Just uh, maybe I can talk about it more later. Anyway, a lot has happened in the video game industry, and I'm ready to talk about it all with you. So let's get into it. But if you're new to the show, so we're hoping to have these podcasts happen at least every weekend, but also during certain weekdays, generally lining up with the evenings when big game news breaks. Now, first, I'll open the show for about 10 minutes to reflect on the show's main topic. And after a small commercial break, we'll set up callers to join the show to either discuss the show's main topic or bring up any gaming topic of their choosing. Once that's run its course, I'll end the show with a fun segment. We'll call it a day, hopefully in about an hour's time. And if it sounds like your kind of podcast, let's get right into it. So, big Nintendo news has taken up a flurry of discussion on the internet, and generally with mixed reviews among Nintendo fans, surprisingly, and I kind of wanted to go into the nuts and bolts of it and kind of add some positivity into the conversation, I suppose. Uh, Of course, talking about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild announcing its DLC plans for post-launch, especially with a season pass added onto it. So I wanted to read some quotes from the official PR press release saying, quote, starting when The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild launches on March 3rd, players will be able to purchase an expansion pass for $19.99, granting access to two new sets of downloadable content for the game when they become available later this year. Now, this will essentially grant access to two sets of main content, Uh, but you also get a little bit at launch. It's it's really interesting. So back to the press release, quote, immediately upon pre-purchase or purchase of the expansion pass, three new treasure chests will appear in the game's Great Plateau area. Now, this is the opening segment of the game that you've seen a lot in the E3 demo area. So just to note there, one of the treasure chests will contain a shirt with a Nintendo Switch logo that Link can wear during his adventure, exclusive to the expansion pass. The other two will deliver useful items. Very vague, but okay. Continuing on, quote, The first content pack is scheduled to launch this summer and will include the addition of a Cave of Trials challenge, a new hard mode, and a new feature for the in-game map. The second content pack will launch in holiday 2017 and adds new challenges that will let players enjoy a new dungeon and a new original story. The expansion pass will be available for both the Nintendo Switch and Wii U versions of the game and are identical. Content packs cannot be purchased individually. That last part is interesting because believe it or not, Nintendo has implemented season pass-like models in the past. Uh, Certain ones come to mind. There's Mario Golf World Tour, which I think was the first one. That was back in 2014. There were three packs that were spaced out over a few months where you had characters for that golf game. uh, Toadette, Nabbit, Rosalina. Uh, It was a total of $14.99 for the whole pack. But if you wanted to buy characters separately, that was $5.99 a piece. Of course, probably the most famous one is Mario Kart 8, where you had two content packs, and over the course of all that, that delivered six new characters, 16 courses of 50% improvement, 200cc races, and much more. I mean, new carts, just all all sorts of things, and that was for $11.99, or $7.99 apiece for the two packs. The most extensive season pass plans, that's for Hyrule Warriors. And they had two season passes for the first game, Hyrule Warriors, and then Hyrule Warriors Legends, which was the addition of all new content also on 3DS, or new 3DS rather. But yeah, two separate content passes at $19.99 apiece. The first one was the Hero of Hyrule pack, 
where he had the Master Quest Pack, Twilight Princess Pack, Majora's Mask Pack, and the Boss Pack. You also had the Dark Link skin available. And most of these were for $7.99 a piece, but the Boss Pack was for $2.99. Then for Hyrule Warriors Legends, you had the Legends of Hyrule Pack, which was Link's Awakening, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks together, A Link Between Worlds, and the Legends Character Pack, which featured Linkle, and those were for $4.99 a piece. So yes, not the first time that Nintendo has tried Season Passes, but it is the first one in a mainline Zelda game that you know people have really focused on. And even then, it's, it's debatable. I mean, you've had DLC in the past with you know certain games. I mean, Twilight Princess was locked behind the Amiibo paywall with the Wolf Link Amiibo. And some people had issues with that, but I think people see season passes and how it's been implemented from other game companies and worry that the same is going to happen with Nintendo. So my take on this whole thing is, yes, it's not the first time that this has been done by Nintendo, but it's the first time on Switch with an eShop that is fully embracing and encouraging this kind of downloadable content model. Uh, of course, many people are saying, and I tend to agree, that it was too early to announce this. And I get that they wanted content right out of the gate, especially in that very beginning of the game area to kind of reward players for putting their money where their mouth is to, to help with you know the further payment, I suppose. But this was kind of compared well with offering dessert before the main course has even arrived. I mean, sure, most people be willing to buy dessert and some may even pay for it up front, but before the game comes out, it comes across a little greedy. So I can understand people's hesitation with how this was messaged by the timing. But overall, I mean, these items on the Great Plateau shouldn't be necessary. I think they're nice little bonuses. I mean, gosh, I mean, the, the, the Switch shirt is superficial at best, really. But we're being told just, oh, there'll be a couple items. And if they were more specific, maybe we could pass further judgment. But in the end, like all season passes, this is optional. Players are not forced to buy this. And maybe it's the completionist aspect that some gamers are priding themselves on doing that they want everything and oh, Nintendo is forcing me to buy more because I want the full experience. Well, not necessarily. And you know, nor should you buy the season pass if you are hesitant at all, if you're waiting to see what is actually included, because people have been certainly burned too many times by bad season passes. I mean, Batman Arkham Knight for $40, Star Wars Battlefront for $50. I mean, $20 is looking pretty good by comparison. But still, Nintendo is trying this because they have seen it work for other companies. And they've probably even had some success with their own games. They're in a position where they need to make more money. And in today's gaming industry, downloadable content, season passes, that's a way to do it. After all, hate it or not, downloadable content, DLC, it's important in today's video game age when it's implemented properly. Yes, it certainly does make more money for the company, but it also keeps players invested. And it's an attempt to limit the trade-ins and you know limit that used game market, especially thinking about it from a corporate perspective. But most importantly, I think it continues the conversation and the buzz of a game online, amongst friends, in forums, throughout the year. And you see this with episodic games, certainly. I mean, with something like The Walking Dead or even last year's Hitman game. The fact that it was spaced out and that we kept talking about it. I mean, Pokemon Sun and Moon with the different announcements. It's not downloadable content, sure, but it's the idea of sustaining buzz. You don't want just to you know fizzle out in a week or two. I mean, what, Titanfall 2? That was you know one of the big things where it was launched among other big titles, but there wasn't much to sustain the game, so discussion about it was limited, and thus the buzz kind of fizzled. So this is a really important aspect to consider, and I think when a lot of people are critiquing this Breath of the Wild season pass, a lot of those critiques have been rooted in misinterpretation. I wanted to kind of look at some of the, the different things that people are saying and kind of provide a counterpoint, really, to what they're saying. So some have said, oh, don't do this, Nintendo. Don't be like every other greedy company out there. I mean, certainly, as we've mentioned already, Nintendo's been trying season passes for a while, and I'm not sure 
why you're just now noticing this. But I think most importantly, you can't have it both ways to say that, oh, Nintendo needs to get with the times. They need to have better online, a good storefront, tie everything together. Oh, but then you critique them for adapting to a common and lucrative industry trend? I mean, they just can't win with that perspective, and that's really not giving them enough credit. Some have also said, oh, remember those days when game shops sold complete games and never asked for anything else? Well, yes, those games could also never be patched, much less have new content added. I mean, some people are saying, like, is this just the way the game industry is with this DLC? Yes. Yes. Welcome to the last generation plus. This is the way things have been. And for Nintendo to kind of join the competition, I mean, almost it's a sense of uh, welcome in a way. But for those saying, well, Nintendo was going to be the last good ones, they should have held out. I I think that's not reading properly what the game industry has become. Another critique is some people are saying that, oh, they're scraping away content from the main game just for DLC. So they are selling you an incomplete game. And to me... This is sensationalist garbage that is ignorant of how game development works. I mean, the main game has been done for a while. They've been in bug testing. There is submission for certification. There is time before a game launches to continue to make new content. And for all intents and purposes, the game appears to be complete and feature rich. Now, if the game launches and reviews are saying that "Ah, these things are missing and that you've held it out in DLC, well... That's a whole other thing entirely. A lot of people have also noted that oh, this difficulty mode behind a paywall, that's, that's just begging and asking for money. I'd say note the wording there, a new difficulty mode. It is still possible that something like a hero mode is in Breath of the Wild. I mean, it'd be very easy to implement with taking double damage. It's been in the last couple Zelda games, right from the beginning even. But maybe this new difficulty is something else entirely. I I think just by saying, oh, difficulty behind a paywall, I think it's jumping to conclusions quite a bit. Yes, other companies have had scummy on-disc practices. I mean, you think back to 2012, there was Street Fighter Cross Tekken. Mass Effect 3 really comes to mind with uh, Javik the Prothean. But if any company has earned the benefit of the doubt with their downloadable content practices so far, I think it would be Nintendo. Another critique that others have had, they say, well, this content should already be in the game for free, so why do I have to pay for it? Of course, it's entitlement at its finest, but would you rather have the game be delayed? I mean, you'd be, you know, dinging Nintendo for that too if they did that to try to fit in all this content. I mean, think about Super Smash Bros. for Wii U and 3DS. Did you buy an incomplete product at launch? Should you have been given those DLC characters for free that were worked on post-launch? I mean, Smash Brothers, a lot of content in that game. Would you say that? I mean, that's not an incomplete game, but it was continued to add more content to continue the life. I mean, it's the same idea with continuing the buzz. Every time those DLC characters were announced, that brought back the discussion for Super Smash Brothers, and that's, it's the same concept there. Overall, I think the denial of DLC's existence is foolish in today's gaming landscape. I mean, there are certainly varying degrees of how honest the practice can be, but what we've seen from Nintendo so far has been on the positive end of that spectrum. Now, I'll be excited to add this to my collection, and if that makes me a lemming and a corporate shill for Nintendo, so be it. But I think it should also be noted that you probably shouldn't get to claim that you're a superior consumer because you make misinformed claims. Now, something I want to get on the record as what do I think this new story could possibly be? I think that this could be the chance for Princess Zelda to be a playable character. And I'm not talking, you know, CDI games or anything like that. But when people were talking about, you know, female Link or something like that as a possibility for Breath of the Wild, maybe something like this would be the perfect chance to have Princess Zelda be a playable character. Now, it does depend on the main story. Uh, You know, depending on what happens, I'm sure a side story of her adventure could possibly be told. I mean, we think back to Skyward Sword. There was certainly a possibility to tell what was Zelda going through during that adventure where you were playing as Link. Uh, I think this would be the best chance for Nintendo to try this out and kind of gauge reception and feedback 
with a decreased financial risk. Instead of making a full new game, you make this as a season pass for those that are going to be your most devoted Zelda players and kind of see where this leads them. Anyway, just wanted to get this all kind of on the record, but that's what I have to say on this subject. Now, when we come back, we'll get to the callers. What do you think about what I had to say? I'd love to hear your thoughts, but you can also bring up whatever gaming topic you would like to discuss. And don't forget, you can also reply to what another caller had to say too. That's all when we come back here on The Power Switch. Welcome back to the Power Switch. Let's get to the callers, see what you have to say. We'll maybe talk some Zelda DLC, maybe anything else. It's really up to you. Joining us from Pennsylvania, Seth. Welcome back to the Power Switch. How are you? I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me on again. No problem. You were here last time when I was uh, out in Chicago, but a week later, catching up with you again. What's on your mind? Um, We got that Zelda DLC and... Honestly, I don't have too big of a problem with it just because uh, I can't think of a single game that Nintendo has really messed up with DLC so far. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've got a pretty good track record so far. So I'm looking forward to it. I'm not looking forward to the Switch t shirt. I wish <laughs> there was a way that, you know, I could just delete that from my game save, but. It does seem a little tacky, and uh, I mean, certainly you can get it and never wear it. Uh, it it's just yeah. probably going to be an option because, you know, Link's going to have you know customizable clothing, you know, different things. There was even a GIF that was going around of uh, if you wear metal, you know, clothing like clothing with you know metal armor, or whatever. If you're wearing it during a thunderstorm, like you can definitely get zapped by lightning and die immediately. Now, granted, they give you a little. Uh, warning ahead of time like you're kind of generating lightning around you so it's kind of like a warning like you might want to change your outfit but yeah yeah, i'm sure that's probably what it is like most people don't have to wear it it's not like a little switch emblem that'll be on link's back staring at you the whole time uh but it's 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 an interesting option uh i just yeah what what do you think to those that you know, think it's, you know, terrible that Nintendo is going this way and they were supposed to be, you know, one of the last holdouts. Um, you know, the season pass, it's, they don't want Nintendo to become corrupted. I mean, uh, what do you think about yeah. that perspective? I mean, it was going to happen eventually. I still think that Nintendo is going to be the only company to do these kinds of uh, programs right. They don't ask for too much for most of their... Uh, DLC, and normally you get just a lot more content than you would normally get with other companies. Um, a lot of other companies just nickel and dime you with the stuff. Bringing up the uh, the thunder part, uh, I, I didn't actually think about that, but uh, you think that we're going to get uh, some, you know, I, I'm assuming it's a white t-shirt, right? Mm, probably. Uh, they didn't have any visual representation, but or, I would or, guess are so. Are we going to get some, like, you know, wet t shirt uh, stuff with Link, you know, because well, you know that don't <laughs> might might be some reason for some people to uh, to wear it, but maybe, maybe. I mean, at that point, you can just say you know shirtless Link. Yeah, granted, you're going to lose oh, yeah. all the defensive bonuses, but if you're if you're just looking for that, you know, you got shirtless Shulk, and especially as a skin in Smash Brothers, you get shirtless Link too. I could imagine. Yeah, but then there are also other people that are saying. You know, that uh, th- this means Breath of the Wild is an incomplete game. I- I've been seeing that a lot lately. Like, I don't want to buy an incomplete game. And I-, I think it's fine to say, oh, well, I'm going to wait to buy this season pass until I know more uh, what's going to be in it, you know, until they you know, specify a little bit more instead of these vague things like, oh, a feature on the map or a story. I get that. But I've also seen people say, well, now I'm canceling my pre-order and I am no longer buying the game. And I think that's ridiculous, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, Nintendo is all about giving complete games. Like, they're the ones who have that saying, you know, release a game. And, man, I don't remember how the saying goes. Yeah, it's the Uh, whole Miyamoto quote, you know, like a, a delayed game can be good, but a, you know... The release game is forever bad. You know, it's something to that extent. Yeah, um, something to that effect. So they're not releasing incomplete games and finishing them later down the line. I'm sure that we're going to have everything that's supposed to be on there at the start. Everything that's absolutely necessary and probably more. 
It's a huge game. And, you know, yeah. the, the Zelda games of the past, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, well, you know, Cave of Trials. We've had those in past Zelda games in Wind Waker HD, you know, Twilight Princess HD. I don't think Skyward Sword had anything like a Cave of Trials, uh, you know, where you just descend to levels and levels and mm-hmm. just an enemy gauntlet, really. Uh, I don't remember that. But then again, I didn't 100% that game. But people are saying that, well, they shouldn't take that out of the game and lock it behind a paywall. And you have no idea there. I think you're just, you can be speculating there with that and considering how this game is designed very differently compared to Zelda games of the past I I don't think that's something that they considered but now that they have extra time to work on it you know the game has gone gold it's going through certification it had a lot of bug tests for uh, arguably I mean some say would say the last several months uh, that you know most of the content had been done but they were just testing it to make sure that it is up to that high standard and you know certainly with switch launch and all that yeah there, there's a lot to consider and I think a lot of the poo-pooing on Nintendo, as it were, I think is coming just from a lot of poor analysis, uh, misinformation, and just poor speculation. Yeah, and I mean, all of that is something uh, Nintendo has known. Honestly, I'm used to it. So <laughs> I'm, I'm not too worried. I think it's going to be great. Now, something else that I was looking to uh, talk about uh, was all of this business that just happened today with uh, Smash Summit for spring 2017. Mm-hmm. Now, I've I've heard a little bit about Smash Summit. I've seen uh, people, you know, this is for the Super Smash Brothers competitive scene. For those that don't mm-hmm. know, it's, it's, I guess it's a big tournament. And it was a way to have fans, you know, provide feedback through fundraising on who they wanted to attend this tournament. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Well... I mean, it is a tournament, but it's uh, more of an invitational. There are only 16 players that uh, get to go to this. So 10 of the top Melee players get invited to begin with, and then we vote for the following six. This isn't a fundraiser for any sort of uh, charity or anything. This is part of a big compendium, which... uh, a lot of the money goes back to the people who make the artwork or provide the products that you can buy in the compendium. The other amount of the money goes towards making the tournament go better. They have uh, tiers for different commentators to be flown out. A lot of money goes into it. I think uh, I saw a tweet somewhere that 100000 uh has already been fundraised i i don't know i used to purchase uh votes for this uh event that's that's big and so this is an entirely grassroots effort and that's that's certainly admirable i mean the super smash brothers scene can do amazing things whether it's you know raising money for charity back at evo 2013 to get melee Mm -hmm. back in into that scene and really have that take off there or, or something like this i mean i was part of the scene for a while in you know my my college days and early days of the the show me your news podcast and all that but even just watching from a distance like that that scene for both the game i mean for melee i mean brawl had its time but you know for now wii u and, and 3ds i mean they it had just this incredible fervor for the game and I, I would argue just some of the most hospitable people in the fighting game community uh, <laughs> they, they really they really take care of their own uh and well oh boy okay there i guess there's a big butt here uh, yes, there, there's a huge but, and if you think about like uh, the fact that we're voting on players, and there's players from all over the world that are top players that are getting voted for this, and whenever you have a kind of vote like this, a popularity vote, it, uh, it can get pretty ugly at times. So far, all of the past summits, of which this is the fourth, but so far all the other three have at least one pick is it's debatable whether you'd call them a top player Hmm. first time you had picks like kage the warrior who i don't know if you remember the name rings a bell yeah you talked about it on show me your news about uh ganondorf had come in and beaten mango Mm -hmm, just out of nowhere back when mango was the best we didn't even know about armada time so he got into the first one not that great but he was very entertaining There was also Alex19, who's just lower sort of player. Years after that, we got Esam and Mafia. And the thing with Mafia last year was that he is a decent peach from New England. And 
as far as fundraising goes, New England got together a huge amount of votes and like they just bought all of these votes and held them off till the very last minute on the first vote where two players get invited, two players get eliminated. And at the beginning of that uh, day, he had been in last place. He was going to get eliminated. And then at the very last minute, they pulled him up. And that same thing just happened today with Infinite Numbers, who is another, he's an ice climbers player from New Hampshire, so the New England territory. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are upset about it. I should mention that Hugs, uh, the Samus player from SoCal, was the other player that got voted in. I'm pretty happy about it. Yeah, he, he deserves it. He's He's been in the scene for a long time. He's been in the scene for a long time, and he's... Uh, He's still up there. Um, mm -hmm. Let me check what rank he is right now. He is 38. Okay. Which uh, infinite numbers is 47. Okay. I think one of the biggest uh, issues that a lot of people have with infinite numbers is that it looks like he's probably going to be the lowest seed in this tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, now, they're doing some kind of pools format, so I'm not sure how it's going to work, but it's obvious that the lowest seed is going to end up playing armada first and if you know anything about the peach uh ice climbers matchup you know it is not good for the ice climbers player mm -hmm. like the best ice climbers players only one of them has ever taken a game off of and infinite numbers everyone is expecting a quick zero and two yeah, at, at the same time, though, from an outside perspective, I mean, there is the, I suppose, allure of the the wild card player, just, you know, the the outsider's chance. Because if enough money was raised, you know, hopefully through legitimate means, then, you know, they deserve the spot. That's the way the rules worked. If they wanted someone who's a higher ranking, then more people should have come together to have that happen. It may not be what everyone wants, but it's the way that the game is played in a way. If the rules are set up a certain way and the money is raised, then, you know, you gotta, you can't, you know, double back and yeah. say, oh, well, we're only going to take people from, you know, that are in the top 30. Like that's, that's not how you've set it up. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm pretty understanding of the fact that it's happening. I do just like venting because it just seems like there's so many reasons right now to the Super Bowl, and you know, now this last year with Mafia <laughs> too. And I don't think anyone really likes New England outside of. Uh, Let me tell you, as, as someone who went up there, like it's it's kind of just lumping that whole area, and, and they're they're very very passionate. That passion, like part of the reason that even though I'm uh, I, I've been more this time around as opposed to uh, and it happened last time with Mafia, the reason I'm less upset now is because I knew that they had some of the best organization last time. They were going to organize a massive spirit bomb, as they like to call it. <laughs> and yeah. they just had it from the beginning. I, I could tell from the start. As far as who got uh, knocked out, we already had eliminated Professor Pro, Drugged Fox, Captain Face Roll Duck, uh, Red and Smash God, and then just most recently, they eliminated Cyrox and Moon. Right now, there is a petition to get him into Smash Summit as just a commentator because he was so popular last time. Mm. I'm just a very personable guy. And Cyrox, I was really holding out for him being the lowest leveled player to get in because even though he is at uh, 67 the smash rank 20 down from infinite numbers as a fox player he stood an infinite number of chances more beating armada than infinite numbers did mm -hmm. despite the name <laughs> despite the name yeah like uh he, he's an up-and-comer it would have been cool to see him go and it ended up, ended up being that infinite number was our meet this year interesting yeah i mean Every fighting game community is not without its own set of drama. And so not everyone is going to be happy with the list when it comes to rules like that for establishing that sort of 16-player uh, tournament. 
Uh, it's an interesting idea for sure, but I think it kind of goes back to like, you know people take care of their own, and when it comes to the case of New England, like they they pick a player and they are, you know, are fully behind them, and you know I'm yep. sure other you know, areas of the country tried to help with similar kind of spirit bombs. It's just a matter of degrees, and you know who was able to push forth their efforts more. Now, when does Smash Summit take place? Smash Summit takes place uh, March second through fifth, uh, okay. right, right during the uh, the Switch launch, which actually had another top player, Wizrobe. He probably stood a good chance of uh, getting in this time because he's been snubbed a few times. But he decided to drop out because he does not want to miss the Nintendo Switch launch. I don't blame him. I don't blame him. We're a little <laughs> more than two weeks out. That's crazy. It's coming up so, so soon. Yeah, I didn't think about it until now, but I'm going to be able to bring the, uh, the Switch tablet. But yeah, I'll, I'll bring that into my uh, to my room and uh, just set the laptop up, watch Smash Summit, and just casually play uh, Zelda. Yeah, that, that should be really exciting. I was even just thinking I had like a work trip scheduled for it's like around, you know, March 8th, 10th, kind of that area. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Switch is going to be out. I can bring it on the plane. I can be like that guy to take the Joy-Cons out of the, the Switch that gamepad guy, yeah. there and be like, I'm on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. No, it should be very exciting. Yeah. Well, thank you for the insight. I you know, had not heard much about Smash Summit, but that's a, that's a good learning experience. Uh, we can find you on Twitter at Major Moses. That's right. I am thinking about uh, streaming again. It's either Twitch, Major Moses 1, or just Major Moses. So It's one of those two. Very good. Well, Seth, thank you so much for calling in. Really appreciate the time. Yeah, no problem. All right, that's all we have available to call in. Again, it's you know these early times of the show and trying to work out times that are best record and people's schedules and all that. And really, it's a matter of if you're available, we're, we're looking to, to participate. These weekdays at 6 p.m. Eastern time, weekends are probably going to be the best time for sure. But yeah, really, it's you know if you want to be on, you certainly can have the chance to participate. Now, when we come back, we'll get to a headline roundup. We've missed a lot in the last week, and we want to get you all caught up. That's all when we come back here on The Power Switch. Welcome back to The Power Switch. This week's Tempo Control music is brought to you by Catherine. You can find a new video game music top 10 list from a specific game soundtrack every Tuesday over at youtube.com slash rhymes with Asia. Now it's time to get into a headline roundup. We start with the big news that Steam Greenlight will be phased out in spring 2017. This was the, the way for indie games to get on Steam with a $100 fee and not too many questions asked, but it turned into a cesspool. I mean, what you had the stat that 40% of Steam's releases and the whole library were released in 2016 and Steam Greenlight's a big result of it. So this will be replaced with Steam Direct. Uh, they still have to determine what the fee per game will be and a way to try to curb how many games get submitted. You don't want any of these you know, asset flips and all that Jim Sterling covers so frequently. But another aspect is going to be that they have to do a lot of registration, almost like if they were applying for a new bank account. So hopefully that has a little more accountability. Uh, so some hope that you know Greenlight is going away that may make for a better Steam library. Uh, but there's still some things to be questioned, I suppose. Also, PlayStation 4 Pro in what seems to be a new feature in an upcoming update will have Boost Mode, which will enhance the performance of all games, regardless if they have a patch specifically for PS4 Pro or not. It's proving to be interesting with some tests that Digital Foundry did, and that, that's a good you know, boost for these sort of you know incremental consoles like PS4 Pro and Xbox One S. If they can boost the performance of past games, you know, regardless of an update, that that's really promising. That seems to be an interesting possible new feature. Also just announced today, Microsoft's E3 conference this year will be on Sunday, June 11th at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Now that means if things generally stay the same as last year, I mean, you had EA and Bethesda on Sunday. And if they kind of keep the 
mid-afternoon and evening time slots on Eastern Time, respectively, uh, that would be a good position. But I think this move is only made for the fact that Microsoft wants the day of their own for first parties. They don't want to have to give the news over to Sony several hours later like when they were both on Monday. So assuming that Sony will stay on Monday, Nintendo may do a direct or a digital event or what have you, probably still on the Tuesday right before the show floor opens. Uh, you know, that that is interesting. It kind of spaces out the press conferences a little bit more because yeah, Monday had the possibility of just getting really crazy. Uh, these tickets went on sale for E3 as we talked about last week with the, the public days and they seem to be pretty well. I haven't seen that they've been sold out, so they're still available if you still want to go, I guess. Um, maybe there's the possibility of if you want to line up and have the possible chance of getting into uh, certain things like the press conferences, but that does not guarantee a place as we talked about last time. So interesting news with E3 2017. Also announced today, Pokemon Go! Johto Generation 2, more than 80 new Pokemon coming later this week. Also some new features, a couple new berries, some new clothing options. Uh, but really the big news is that Johto Pokemon are arriving. Uh, you had some already that were, you know, the baby Pokemon. Of course, the legendaries won't be added in. They still haven't even added the legendaries for Gen 1, but the spots are now there on the, the Pokedex. Just they have no plans yet to fill in those monsters for capture. But yes, I mean, the, the rest of the Johto Pokemon, the starters, you know, evolutions from Generation 1, just new Pokemon, should be exciting. Uh, this is long overdue. I wonder how many people will actually be interested. I mean, I'll, I'll pick Pokemon Go up again, you know, do some walks around the neighborhood. Uh, but a lot of people, I think, have already checked out. And we'll see the numbers, and it's, it still makes a lot of money, but we'll see if it spikes back up to the number one grossing on the App Store or something like that. Also, the TV show that was from Nickelodeon and Frederator and from the video game industry, you know, a franchise 30 years in the making, we had talked about, I think it was at least brought up several months ago. It's been confirmed to be Castlevania. It's going to be a Netflix show, you know, with Frederator as doing the animation there, but it's going to be an R rating. It's going to be serious, and that's, that's pretty exciting. Get a gritty Castlevania TV show. A lot of people looking forward to that coming in 2017. PewDiePie is in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Uh, basically, the gist of it is that for one of his videos, he had people hold up a sign that said, quote, death to all Jews. Uh, very, very poor taste, just really awful stuff. And he's trying to spin it as that, you know, his, his shock and edgy humor that he went on the website Fiverr, where people will do anything for $5 and attempt to make money. Uh, that I guess he found some people that wanted to, you know, hold a sign or whatever that could say anything that they want and he was trying to make a statement on how people will do anything and all that. But yeah, it really doesn't come across that way when you spin that vile nonsense. Basically, the, the big news is that there's been a lot of fallout from this because Disney, who owns Maker Studios, who supports PewDiePie, does not want to associate themselves with such nasty messaging. So they have parted ways with PewDiePie. YouTube has canceled his YouTube Red show that was gonna be in a second season, and they've removed him from premium advertising. Now, if any indication is, you know, based on PewDiePie's past stunts, what with the whole canceling my account, he's probably going to spin this in a way that gets him more notoriety. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of his, but the, he tries to say it's a joke, and it's really not. It, it just comes off in very poor taste, and it'll be interesting to see how he can somehow spin out of it because he has a very large audience and it's one that's likely not going to go away anytime soon. And finally, Konami is reporting $230 million profits. And now they're, they're focusing all their efforts on the, the pachinko games and all these sorts of other means of money making as opposed to big AAA console games. And hey, if it works for them, great. Uh, I just ask, don't put a, a big chokehold on uh, these classic IP that they're surely going to run in the ground with these uh, these questionable gaming practices. But, you know, if, if they're making money, then I suppose that is good for their company. It's good for their bottom line. But it's, it just, it's a sad story for what they used to be for the game industry and what their intellectual property used to mean and no longer, unfortunately. Isn't that game, what the, that Metal Gear game, still coming out in 2017? That multiplayer one with zombies that nobody cares about? Uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to wait and see on that one. 
And that'll do it for this episode of The Power Switch. We are hosted by RhymesWithAsia.com and we're on YouTube and Twitch at RhymesWithAsia. Find us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at The Power Switch. And you can email us any questions, concerns, comments, or opportunities at PowerSwitchPod at gmail.com. Most importantly, to participate in future episodes, you should join our community on Discord by visiting RhymesWithAsia.com slash call. It's a small but growing community, and in these early months of the show, it'll be easier than ever to have your voice heard on this podcast. If you'd like a YouTube video to watch, a recommendation, if you haven't watched Red Letter Media, that channel, you really should. Very interesting content that they produce there, you know, from the Plinkett reviews to their show Best of the Worst, which I find highly enjoyable. Uh, But they recently started a new podcast that they call The Nerd Crew. And if you want a podcast that is consistently, just the whole time, it's just biting and sarcastic the whole time, Uh, episode two in particular, talking about the new title for episode eight of Star Wars, and then they go into the second half is just a biting criticism of the nerd culture boxes. So they look at nerd box and geek crate the companies that they make up it's just a biting critique of loot crate and the other sorts of uh, memorabilia collections so yes the nerd crew episode two from red letter media go check it out all right we'll get to record on a weekend this time definitely here at home at least i think so i hopefully i'm i'm leaving late sunday night to go out to texas because The work travel never seems to end, but maybe during the day on Saturday we'll get in time in for a recording episode. Hopefully more people get to join in. That should be better for most of your schedules. You know, if you're working Monday through Friday, yes, 6 p.m., it may be tough for you. But we'll get to see hopefully some uh, new gaming news will, will pop up from now until then. And if anything big happens, we'll probably schedule another episode until then. Regardless whether it's live on your own time, I look forward to you joining us for our next episode. Now with that, I'm Peter Spasia. Until next time, switch up, call in, Game on.